It was election time in Ireland and Greece. In the former incumbent party Fianna Foyle gained the most seats but failed to win a majority in the Doyle, leading Taoiseach Charles Hockey to enter a coalition with the minority Progressive Democrat Party. In Greece, the incumbent Social Democratic PASOK party were defeated after Andreas Papandreou's government had been embroiled in a series of scandals, but the opposition Conservative New Democracy Party also didn't quite have a majority. Left with little choice, an unlikely alliance was made between New Democracy and the far-left Sinas Pismos party for a fixed short-term period with compromised candidate Tsanis Tsanitakis in charge. The new government's mandate was to sort out the fallout from the various PASOK scandals and prepare the country for a new election in October. China also had a new leader, as Zhao Ziyang's rather short reign of two and a half years came to an end, and Jiang Zemin became the new leader of the Chinese Communist Party in the wake of the Tiananmen Square events. His predecessor Zhao had been a reformer, and was removed by the so-called Eight Elders, who held much of the real behind-the-scenes power in China, over his support for the student demonstrators. However, far from the hardliner some had expected, Jiang was regarded as a moderate leader who advocated tackling corruption within the Communist Party and working to persuade people of the party's policies rather than just imposing them. The ongoing Israel-Palestine conflict saw one of its more notorious incidents as a commuter bus between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem was the subject of an attack by a member of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, who seized the bus's steering wheel, sending it off a steep cliff into a ravine, killing 16 people and wounding 27 more. The attacker survived and was treated in hospital, but he had intended not to, and the bus 405 attack is regarded as the first suicide attack in the sorry history of this conflict. The F1 teams arrived in A France preparing for a big party, as five days after the race, it would be the 200th anniversary of the storming of the Bastille, so the French contingent in the paddock were even more keen than usual to do well on home tarmac. Two of them would be new faces too, because there'd been a round of musical chairs following the Canadian Grand Prix. Ken Tyrrell had finally managed to get himself some sponsorship on the back of good results so far this season from Dutch parcels company XP, but more significantly from Camel, who looked to be diversifying their F1 portfolio from the floundering Lotus team. Unfortunately, Michele Alboreto had personal sponsorship with Marlborough and he was out, hopefully just for this race while they sorted something out, said Ken, though Paddock Insiders said the relationship between the men had been difficult all year. In a substitute came Camel's pick, highly rated F3000 driver Jean Alesi. Over at Benetton, Johnny Herbert had also been replaced, given another three months for his legs to heal properly was the official line, and both Johnny and the team were making all the right positive noises about an ongoing relationship, but it was difficult to escape the rumour that he'd been sacked after his DNQ in Montreal. In the number 20 Benetton would instead sit McLaren test driver Emanuele Pirro, though apparently Alboreto had been sniffing around the seat as well, further putting Ken Tyrrell's nose out of joint. Pirro at Benetton was a bit of a problem for Gerard LaRousse, though, because after his team's bad form in North America, he had summarily fired both his drivers and hired Pirro, along with another promising local Eric Bernard. With Pirro getting a better offer, LaRousse rather sheepishly rehired Alio, with Bernard taking over from Yannick Dalmas. Ironically, both Alio and Dalmas had been featured on the posters and programmes for the race. And at Arrows, an equally sheepish Derek Warwick called in sick after injuring himself driving go-karts, and he recommended personal friend and Lotus test driver Martin Donnelly as a replacement, again hopefully just for the one race, especially given Silverstone was next up and Derek definitely wouldn't want to miss his home race. Giovanni Roberto Alesi, as he was born, was born in Avignon to Sicilian parents, and he spent much of his formative years hanging around his dad's car body shop and accompanying him on amateur rally and hill climb events. Alesi Jr. had originally thought he might go into rallying himself, but tried karting at 16, entering the French Renault 5 Turbo Championship at 19, and ending up going down the single-seater route. In 1985, he ran his own Delara Alpha chassis and French Formula 3, being picked up for 1987 by the strong Oreca team and dominating the season. In 1988, Oreca moved him to their Formula 3000 team, but it was a struggle with just one podium visit, second in POW, en route to 10th in the table. But buccaneering Irish team owner Eddie Jordan saw something in him and hired him to partner Martin Donnelly for 1989, and in the first four races of the season so far, he'd won in POW and scored points at Silverstone and Jerez. 
Hugh Peter Martin Donnelly was another young man with an amateur racer dad, and on turning 17 he got his own Formula Ford car and began racing around his native Northern Ireland as often as possible, once managing four race meets in a bank holiday weekend. Throughout the mid-80s he fairly powered through the Irish racing scene before moving across the water to Britain and Formula Ford 2000, where he was in contention for the 1985 Euro Series until the last race. F3 was next up, coming in third in his first season with Swallow Racing in 1986, and third again in 1987, and winning the prestigious Macau Grand Prix that year to boot. A test in an F3000 Onyx didn't come to anything, despite being half a second quicker than anyone else, so he stayed in F3, now with the Intersport team, before being hired by Eddie Jordan for the last five races of the 1988 season. He won on his debut, but it was a hollow victory, as that was the race where Johnny Herbert had his major crash. Nonetheless, his five races for Jordan saw him take two wins and two second places to come third overall in the standings despite only having driven five races. Remaining with Eddie Jordan and new teammate Jean Alesi, he also signed a test contract for Lotus. In fact, he tells one story of taking a friend along to an Imola test who used to run a roadside cafe. And as they passed the McLaren pit, Senna dashed out, hugged the friend and said, What are you doing here? Have you brought me a bacon sandwich? The cafe had been a favourite hangout spot for South American drivers in England, including Senna, Gugelman, Moreno and Roberto Guerrero. Emanuele Piro, born in Rome, had another amateur racer father, who once entered his Fiat 600 in the Mille Miglia by driving it up from Rome to Brescia, doing the thousand miles and then driving it home again. Young Emanuele was karting champion of Italy at just 14, and then runner-up in both European and World Karting Series before moving into Formula Fiat Abarth and winning that too at just 18. The following year he was invited to drive a Lancia in the Daytona 24 Hours, in which he and his co-drivers finished 5th overall and won their category. But Le Mans 1981 saw a tragic and traumatic event for young Emanuele co-driving with Beppe Gabbiani. An accident killed a marshal and a driver, and Piro believed Gabbiani had also been killed. Once it was established that Beppe was OK, they left the circuit together, but Piro vowed never to race at Le Mans again. But he continued in endurance racing, winning the Kyalami 9 hours with Michele Alboreto, while also moving into single-seaters in F3, then into F2 in 1984 with the Onyx team, and then on with them into the new F3000 series in 1985, winning two races. He tested for Brabham and was even offered a race seat for Montreal and Detroit, but while it didn't come off, he did get noticed by BMW, who put him in for the Monza 500k and a works ride for 1986, fitting around his F3000 season. He had an offer of a race seat from Ken Tyrrell in 1987, but instead signed up as McLaren test driver, moving to Japan and entering Japanese F3000. His endurance racing pedigree turned out to be the perfect fit for slogging around Suzuka over and over again, fine-tuning the Honda engine ready for its 1988 debut. He estimated that that year he'd taken a flight on average every 3.3 days to some event, race meeting or other, so a flight over to France to do F1 was just another day at the office for him, especially with the equivalent of 35 Grand Prix distances in a McLaren under his belt. Eric Bernard was another local boy like Jean Alesi, born in the south of France. He started karting at 12 and won four French titles in seven years before going to the prestigious Winfield Racing School at Paul Ricard. It was a strong cadre for that year's Volant Elf Prize, but Eric beat both Bertrand Gachot and Jean Alesi to first place and the prize of a fully sponsored drive in Formula Renault. He came sixth in his first year, 1984, then won at the second attempt and entered French F3 in 1986, and came second the following year after a season-long battle with a lazy. Taken on by Team Ralt for an F3000 drive in 1988, it was a tough year with two disqualifications and a DNQ, but second place to Donnelly at the final race in Dijon saw him finish the season ninth, just two points ahead of that man Jean Alesi. 1989 with Dams had promised better things, and he nearly won in Pau before he was nerfed off, and Alesi took the win instead, but Eric got the win the next time out in Jerez. Clearly, Alesi and Bernard is a rivalry that's going to run and run. Blimey, that was a lot. But the French media had almost no time for Messrs Alesi and Bernard, never mind Pirro or Donnelly, because the big news in the paddock was that Alain Prost had announced that he would be leaving McLaren at the end of the year. Going where? He didn't say. One strong rumour had him replace Patrese to reunite with Renault in an all-Francophone Williams lineup. 
Who would replace him at McLaren? Would Senna insist on a definite number two driver as he had at Lotus? If so, who? Other teams had news of their own too. Benetton finally, finally had their new B189 car ready, just one chassis for Nanini, while John Barnard had tried moving the alternator in the Ferrari to somewhere it might not overheat quite so often, and Brabham's new managing director Teddy Mayer was out again after just two weeks in the seat. Trouble ahead for the impressively revived team. The pre-qualifiers went out on track almost entirely ignored while Monsieur Prost was giving his press conference. The Pirelli Q tyres didn't seem to be working on the hot abrasive surface here, as well as they had at other tracks, and for the first time in 1989 the Brabhams weren't top of the table. Instead, the Onyxes of Gasho and Johansson both made it through for the first time, with Caffey third, and very much looking forward to not having to do this anymore, and Modna squeaking in in fourth, with Brundle missing the cut once again alongside Larini, a bit of a come down after his Montreal heroics. The rest were nowhere near this top five, though they were all getting a bit closer. Qualifying proper got underway with a good old-fashioned ding-dong battle for pole between Senna and Prost, and while Senna was on top after Friday's session, it was new boy a lazy who snatched all the headlines by going tenth fastest in the Tyrrell, a fact which Philippe Alio, an even more excellent seventh after his brush with unemployment, might have felt slightly aggrieved at. Almost everyone except a lazy improved their Saturday times, though, and Prost had a home pole by just 0.025 seconds, with Mansell third and Nanini fourth in the new Benetton. Boots and Berger shared row three, Alio remained an impressive seventh alongside Patrese, with Palmer putting his upstart teammate firmly in his place by lining up ninth alongside Gugelman. Gasho and Johansson looked good, qualifying the Onyxes 11th and 13th, bracketing Capelli's march. Donnelly got his arrow set up just how he liked it, and was 14th alongside Eric Bernard, who must have smirked as he had qualified a lazy by one place. The Ligiers made up a four-strong French squad, ahead of the low tie of Nakajima and Piquet on row 10. Perrault's old Benetton could only manage 24th on his debut, just ahead of Cheever, who'd had his Saturday time ruled out for a rear wing infringement. Caffey was on the back of the grid with his Pirelli shod Delara teammate De Cesaris out of luck after his fine third place in Canada. He would join Sala, Dana and Moreno in missing out. The weather, as usual in the south of France in July, was sweltering. One reason the Pirellis weren't having a good time, and many were predicting a lot of retirements. They seemed to be right as Berger tried out both his race car and the spare before deciding to take the spare for the race. Ricardo Petrese's Williams didn't even make it round the formation lap before expiring with an electrical fault in the new Evolution Renault engine, to his immense frustration. The rest lined up for the start and charged for the first corner, with Senna getting the drop on Prost, but behind them, Gugelman arrived way too fast, collided with Boots and bounced off Mansell and flipped over, sending bits flying and creating absolute chaos. There was absolutely no way that wasn't going to result in a red flag, with cars and bits of cars all over the place. A dazed but intact Gugelman was helped out of the car and sent off to see Professor Sid Watkins, who also had a quick word with Nigel Mansell, who'd been clouted on the head by flying debris. Both were fine and would take the restart, but Nigel's car was damaged, and after a forthright exchange of views, the pit crew repaired the oil leak in Berger's race car and renumbered it for him, but not quite in time to make it out of the pit, so he'd be starting from the pit lane, along with Gugelman, and Martin Donnelly, who would be driving the spare arrows, which had been set up for Cheever's oversteering style. Somehow Bootson's car wasn't too dog-eared, though, so he would take the start, which meant Petrosi would also be able to start in the spare Williams, which had the older engine installed. The clean-up was remarkably quick, and everyone was ready to go again before too much longer, with nobody actually having retired as a result of the epic pile-up. Off they went once more, and again it was sensational, albeit this time less destructive, as Senna immediately felt something let go and trundled forwards with cars herring around him as he pulled over to the left to retire, his differential gone. So Prost had the lead with Berger second and Nanini third, with Boots and fourth and Alio passing Patrese for fifth. Senna, meanwhile, climbed out and was allegedly torn off a strip by race starter Roland Brincherider, who seemed to think he should have pulled across to retire against the pit wall. In any case, no points for Senna for the third race in a row. Could Prost capitalise? Bootsen nearly repeated Gugelman's accident at the end of lap one when his own brakes locked up, but otherwise all was well. Gugelman himself pulled in with a misfire and lost several laps in the pits having all the spark plugs changed, while his teammate Capelli was charging, passing Patrese and Alio into fifth, by which time Prost was pulling away from Berger, who led a three-car group with Nanini and Bootsen. 
Berger overcooked things on lap 12 and bumped across the dusty runoff area, rejoining just ahead of Capelli and then dropping behind him as he tried to scrub the dust off his tyres. Prost caught up to the last cars, Caffey and Gugelman, as Berger came in for new boots on lap 14, rejoining 12th behind Johansson, who'd just been passed by a charging Mansell. Meanwhile, Patrese had made his way back past Alio, so it was Prost, Nanini, Bootsen, Capelli, Patrese and Alio at about a quarter distance, with Palmer and Lazy in the Tyrrells 7th and 8th, and Gasho 9th on his debut in the Onyx. Prost's next problem was a big string of cars, led by Stefano Modena, and although his lead over Nanini was 10 seconds, that could evaporate quickly if he was his usual methodical self, but in the event, Nanini pitted for tyres instead. Most drivers were going to need to at some point, a fact Berger would be banking on, to get him back into contention after his own forced stop. So Bootsen moved up to second as Prost made his way past Modena to the front of that train of cars. Nanini, on his new tyres, got back past Patrese into fourth, which became third when Capelli pitted, while Berger became just the fourth retirement on lap 30 when his clutch gave out, so some progress from Ferrari it wasn't the alternator or the gearbox for a change. Bootsen was second and making his way through that big queue of traffic when Berger retired, so the order on about lap 30 was Prost, Bootsen, Nanini, Patrese, Alesi, Alio, and Palmer in seventh. Tarquini's engine gave up a lap later, dropping oil on the apex of a corner which sent Pirro onto the dusty runoff, though he was able to keep it going without any problem. Some brave marshals stepped out to drop some sand on the oil. Bootsen made his own pit stop on lap 34, which promoted Nanini back to second place, just as Alio's good weekend ended with a dud Lamborghini, promoting Jonathan Palmer into the points. But Bootsen was missing second and fifth gears now, and was dropping back as Prost came in for tyres, in plenty of time to go back into the lead. At about the half-distance mark then, Prost led Nanini by about eight seconds until the new Benetton broke its left rear suspension arm, sending Sandro skidding off into the escape road and just managing to avoid the Lotus in the process. So now it was Capelli in second place, great work after qualifying 12th, with a lazy third, Patrese fourth, Mansell now up to fifth, and an ailing boots in sixth. But not for long because Capelli's engine went on lap 44, so now a lazy, on his debut, in a Tyrrell, was second. The crowd went bananas, as the driver no one had ever heard of three days earlier looked like he might end the day on the podium. And even if he didn't, he'd done quite enough already to announce his presence. As if to emphasise matters, he put a lap on Palmer, who was having all sorts of car trouble and had just made a second pit stop, emerging 17th. Alesi had Patrese bearing down on him, though, and behind both of them was Mansell, with the bit well and truly between his teeth. Another debutant, Martin Donnelly, was having a hard time, with no drink bottle, a car set up for a completely different driving style, and a visor now almost completely opaque with oil and debris, which is probably why he went straight on the escape road and had to get going again. A lazy pitted for tyres, which allowed Patrese back up into his by now customary second place, still with Mansell hot on his heels, while Bootsen finally gave it up as a bad job when he lost sixth gear two on lap 51 and pulled in to retire. Prost, still lapping away untroubled at the lead, thus led Patrese and Mansell with a lazy fourth, Johansson up to an excellent fifth in the Onyx, and Guiar sixth in the Ligier, and Eric Bernard seventh in the remaining LaRousse Lola, who was hanging on to the back of the Patrese Mansell scrap pretty well. Patrese came up to lap Gugelman, several laps down, but driving quickly, and he'd just put up the fastest lap as well. Between chasing Mauricio and defending from Nigel, Ricardo had a lot to think about, and a momentary lapse in concentration is all it took to send him backwards off the track. He kept it going and bumped back onto the track, setting off again to scrub the dirt off his tyres. Mansell was by now 43 seconds behind Prost as he made his way past Gugelman, with just 15 laps to go, so he wasn't likely to catch the leader, but he was in the box seat if anything should happen to the number 2 McLaren. Something happened to Stefano Modena, retiring from an uneventful race in 12th with an engine failure, and probably not too sorry to be out of a deeply frustrating race. With the laps ticking down, everyone else was just concentrating on finishing. Not always successfully, Eric Bernard's Lamborghini also let go when he was running a great seventh on his debut as Alain Prost commenced his last lap. He swept majestically around the circuit to take his fourth home win. Only Fangio has won the French Grand Prix more often. Mansell brought the Ferrari home second for his and the Scuderia's second points finish, second finish of the year, with Patrese taking his fourth podium in a row. Jean Alesi capped a very strong debut with three points for fourth place, with Johansson's Onyx 
taking the team's first points in fifth, and Guiar opening his own account with a point for sixth place. Eddie Cheever finished seventh, just outside the points for the third time this year, but still not bad from 25th on the grid, with debutants Pirro, Bernard, Donnelly and Gasho all classified, 9th, 11th, 12th and 13th respectively, though neither Eric nor Bertrand had actually been running at the end. Alesi's three points on his debut matched Johnny Herbert's achievement from earlier in the year, and indeed the last driver to score in their first race had been Alain Prost back in 1980, so the omens were good for both men. With Senna not having scored for the last three races, which Prost had won two of, Alain now took an 11-point lead in the championship, and indeed Ayrton was having to look over his shoulder at Patrese. That Mansell was fourth after just two points finishes, admittedly a first and a second, showed the way that the top three had hogged so many of the points so far, while an astonishing 23 drivers had put at least one point on the board before the halfway point of the season. That halfway point would arrive in just seven days' time after the British Grand Prix at Silverstone. in motor racing and a single seater racing car is the nicest thing to drive. I enjoy to race Formula 1, it's exciting. I like to race. <laughs> I like succeeding, winning or trying to, or getting as near to it as I can do. The money. Drive me as fast as I can a racing car. I know what I don't like speaking to you. <laughs> 